the shooting range. In this episode, Pages of History. First, turboprop strike aircraft. Tactics and strategy. Toss cats. And metal beasts. Punchy trophy. The Summer Extreme event is almost over, so it's time to try its main awards. We'd like to begin with the lowest tier vehicle received by most players. Please welcome a German wheeled tank destroyer, the Panzerspivagen P204. Its main and only caliber is a 50mm gun with elevation angles between minus 12 and plus 14 degrees. The engine is found in the rear while the transmission is in the bottom of the hull. The ammo racks are found in the hull center and turret sides. French vehicle enthusiasts must have already noticed that the lower part of this machine looks suspiciously familiar. And for good reason. The Germans used Trophy AMD 35 hulls to build this vehicle. In War Thunder, this chassis can boast an excellent speed both forward and in reverse. Even compared to pretty mobile Rank 1 tanks, the French and German wheelers feel like race cars which makes it easy for them to reach good positions among the first. Now, what all AMD 35 modifications lacked was good armament. Both 25 and 47 mm cannons used solid shots, ordnance with unreliable performance against armor found at this rank and a subpar after penetration effect. The German vehicle, however, knows no such issues. It's a tank destroyer after all. Its 50mm cannon with a quick reload and good capped rounds leaves no chance to the enemy. The depression angles are also nice, by the way. Minus 12 degrees. No bump under your wheels will impede your aim and successful hits. The only flaw is the low horizontal and vertical traverse speed. But is it really a flaw at rank 1? More like a historical feature. With a high speed and a powerful gun, this machine is all about decisive, quick action. The P204 is a perfect vehicle to learn how to play aggressively, but also reasonably. It promotes great tactical ideas and rewards you with frags, but forgives no mistakes. This wheeler's armor can't hold even a small punch, so you need to be able to predict danger and shoot first when you play it. This story isn't about the wyvern alone. It's more about the concept this machine created. And of course, it's about the creator, aircraft engineer Teddy Petter, who Britain widely considered a pretty odd gentleman. The aircraft he made were just as odd as he was. With unconventional designs, sometimes even radical or grotesque, they somehow flew pretty well. Although it's still a question why they flew. That's right. Take the whirlwind, for instance. When the military officials first saw it, they were shocked. They said, this thing will never fly. But it did, and it did so splendidly. The odd twin-engined plane, however, was impossible to adapt to the missions the Royal Air Force wanted, so it was quickly discarded. But it did an amazing job at laying the foundations for the concept of a British twin-engined fighter. The bow fighter and the mosquito were created using the experience gained from the whirlwind. Still, the most exciting story happened when Teddy Petter claimed he knew perfectly well how to make a multi-role fighter bomber with torpedo capabilities for the Royal Navy. The Navy just gave up on him. Let him build whatever he wants. It was the third year of the war, and the Navy was still using obsolete swordfish biplanes. Proposed replacements were either no good or met with such issues that no mass production could be expected in the next year or two. And when the first prototype wyvern was built, albeit with a piston engine at first, it felt like one couldn't have given it a less natural shape. The Navy violently rejected the 24-cylinder H-block engine from Napier. They did the same to a competing project by Blackburn. And while the future creators of the Firebrand chose to patiently wait for the 18-cylinder radial Bristol Centaurus engine to be ready, Teddy Petter would have none of it. You see, he wasn't the only odd gentleman. 
he had odd friends. For instance, John Digby from British Electric, a big enthusiast of turboprop engines, a type considered exotic at the time. We think you know where this is heading and how Her Majesty's Navy reacted to it. Only, it happened after the war. Teddy Petter found no support at the time. The aircraft industry was entering the turbojet era, putting attackers and Seahawks onto carrier decks, while also making propellers, even the super-advanced contra-rotating ones, an anachronism. Look at this wyvern, the first ever turboprop combat aircraft, take off from a carrier's deck. Just enjoy its odd beauty while we tell you what happened next. The wyvern's life was actually pretty short. By the late 1950s, it was retired as a pointless and completely outdated plane. World aviation was feverishly building jet engines, and racing for top speed felt like the only true way. Turboprop strike aircraft like the American A2D Skyshark, the Soviet Tu-91, or the French Breguet Alize anti-submarine aircraft found no wide fame. The Wyvern, however, would be remembered much later with the rebirth of strike aviation. Oh, then they'd understand how good this concept of a light turboprop striker is. Have you ever heard how the famous Mustang became a turboprop? Or like in the 21st century, basically right now, we have turboprops like the Pilatus PC-21, the Calidus B-250, or the Super Tucano. All of those planes were inspired by the Wyvern. Here she is, watch her climb. As for Teddy Petter, he was undeterred after another cold welcome received by his creation. He would go on to make a few more planes whose value would only be discovered with time. But that's a story for some other time. The latest major update introduced some changes to the ballistic computer mechanics. It simplified close air support for jet aircraft and made it possible to use new combat tactics. For instance, you can now attack ground targets by tossing your ordnance. Let's talk about how you can hit a target without even seeing it. The main advantage of tossing is the ability to employ unguided weaponry at a longer distance, outside of air defense range. You can use both bombs and rockets for this. Let's start with the rockets. Take as many blocks of them as you can, place them closer to the center line of the aircraft, and join a battle. Once you spawn, get close to the ground to make yourself invisible to enemy AA. It'll also help you gain speed, and the higher your speed, the further your rockets will fly. Just keep in mind that some planes have a limit on rocket launch speed. Now let's talk about aiming. If you simply launch the rockets towards the enemy, you're unlikely to score a hit. You need a squad mate to be efficient, someone who can leave a squad marker on the target. If you have one, just turn towards the ground part of the map, pitch up, place your sights at the marker's lowest point, and fire. You don't even need to see the enemy. Your rockets will follow a flat trajectory above some obstacles and hit it. Once your rockets are away, you can turn and go lower to a safe area. Your success depends on a number of factors. The main one is the accuracy of the squad marker. The target choice is also important. Your spotter should pick a vehicle with weaker armor and slow or no movement. Anti-aircraft vehicles are the best choice. The ordnance you use also matters. Smaller caliber rockets like the Mighty Mouse or the S-8 are better launched in dozens. The Zuni or the S-13 have much more explosives, so two or three might be enough. The heaviest rockets, however, like the S-24 or the S-25, aren't a really good choice for tossing. This type of attack has low accuracy, and launching multiple heavy rockets at a single target might be a waste. You can also do some tossing on your own. You'll have to spot your target yourself, though, by looking at strategic points capture or team markers on the map. Both rockets and bombs can be used with this tactic, attacking light vehicles and tanks alike. But bombs come with their own difficulties. Tossing a bomb over an obstacle is much harder, even with a squad marker. That's why we think it's best if the pilot can actually see the target. Some might remember that planes have rotary wing siblings, and some of those have ballistic computers too. 
but tossing on choppers is probably not a good idea. Only a few of them can achieve 300 kilometers an hour with a load, while tossing rockets needs even higher speeds. Trying to use this tactic on a helicopter is more like braking with an altitude gain, pitching the nose down, and shooting in level flight. Don't expect tossing to be efficient in any way with a chopper. If you want to see it in action, check out episode number 231 of the shooting range. We attempted this challenge there. It was a fun experiment, but it wasn't what you'd call a major success. Is there anything we missed here? Tell us in the comments. Meanwhile, we'll answer some of your questions. The first question was sent by a player called Alpha Wolf. Should I get the F-16 first or the F-14B? Hi there, Alpha Wolf. The F-14B is more versatile. It's great for long-range air battles and precision ground strikes with laser-guided munitions. The F-16, on the other hand, is more exciting in close-range combat and unguided casts. TSF-71 asks, which plane can hold the most unguided rockets in the game? Hi, TSF. It's the Phantoms. They can carry no less than 285 rockets. Another question comes from David Martin. Will you add AIM-7 Sparrow missiles to aircraft such as the F-4F Phantom? Hi, David. In real life, the German Phantoms never carried Sparrow missiles, so we're not planning to add them in the game. Captain Frostbite writes, What's the difference between the AJ-37 and the AJS-37? Hey, Captain Frostbite. The AJS modification received additional external hardpoints for extra sidewinders. Besides, it can carry the all-aspect RB-74 and up to four Maverick missiles. And the last comment for today was written by Quantox. Why can't Stingers or similar IR missiles lock onto helicopters from their normal range of 5 to 6 kilometers, instead of the 2 to 3 kilometers in-game? Hi there! It has to do with the helicopter exhaust being much colder than that on jets. It's extra visible when you compare helis with afterburning fighters. Besides, helicopters fly at lower speeds, so they don't heat up much from air drag. All of this affects the lock-on range of the missiles. That's it for today. You've been watching The Shooting Range by Gaijin Entertainment, and the next episode will premiere the following Sunday at 4 p.m. GMT or noon Eastern Time. Subscribe and click the bell if you don't want to miss our next videos. Don't forget to toss a ceramic bomb to add insult to injury. Leave a like, share your thoughts and comments, and see you next week.